right, good morning everybody. How are we doing today? Good, one more time, how are we doing? Good. <laughs> good, I, I'm loving this extra energy that we have today, especially for Retail Innovation Lab, so welcome if you are here for that. If you're not, please stay and check that out. It's a really, really great program that we have this week. Uh, but my name is Lauren Finnegan. I'm one of your city coordinators, along with Christy and Matt. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're here every Wednesday, 9 to 10 a.m. Uh, big, big thank you to The Deck for being our awesome and gracious host and venue. So please give a round of applause. We can't do it without them. Beautiful space. Yes. Um, if you've not been before, One Million Cups is an educational program produced by the Kauffman Foundation to engage, uh, create, connect uh, entrepreneurs, and then help build startups on a grassroots level. Today we'll have three presenters. They'll each get six minutes to pitch with 10 minutes Q&A and feedback. So we will have uh, this microphone being handed around. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand high. Christy will come find you. And uh, we just ask that you please speak up. That way it can catch on our video since we do have a YouTube channel that we hope you all subscribe to. It's pretty great. Um, but without further ado, I would love to introduce our first speaker today. So please, everyone, it's our tradition that we stand up, give a huge round of applause for Chef Ida Lee. So everyone, please welcome her to the stage. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, as I said, I'm Chef Ida Lee. Uh, my company is Luscious Legacies. And uh, basically, how I got started in this was back in the 80s, I presented a signature truffle to people. And it was something I made out of my apartment. And they're called the Ida Lees of Texas. I still, I still market those today, actually. Um, and I went, sold it all over the United States. A friend of mine got me in touch with, uh, she invited me to a party and told me to bring some of my truffles. And it put me in touch with uh, buyers such as Neiman Marcus, Macy's, Hilton, Hyatt, people. I was in 23 states around the country within six months. It was really scary. So uh, I developed that. And then after a while, nine and a half years, uh, I kind of got burnt out. So I sold off part of the business, put the rest on hold, and uh, went to culinary school, went to the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Fabulous experience. Uh, one of the greatest things in my life was studying under uh, family and um, master chefs that I studied under. It was a fantastic experience. Came back to Texas, settled in Dallas, because uh, I was in Houston, and I settled in Dallas. And I decided that my entrepreneur spirit was crying out. So I had gone to some parties and I had, you know, people would say, well, bring some, you know, bring a side dish, chef, okay. So I would bring my coleslaw. And everybody said, oh my gosh, this is the, the best coleslaw I've ever had. Said, Thank you. So a gentleman came up to me and he said, I want to put you in touch with a coal packer. I'm like, what? Okay. So I took him up on that opportunity, and that is where I'm at today. Um, I work with a co-packer that manufactures my products, and I sell to mostly hotels, caterers, um, private people that want my product, and I just got an account a couple months ago with a retail place. So I came out with a retail bottle of my sauce as well, which I brought with me, I can show you. And um, one of the things that I'm realizing in running my business is that I can't do everything. And I need to start learning how to work on my business instead of in my business. And that's been a hard, <laughs> hard project for me, okay? Because I like taking control of everything and making sure that I give the best experience to my customers as possible every time. It doesn't matter. My product is really consistent. If someone came to me and said, Chef, this coleslaw is really weepy. I don't know what we're doing, you know? And I'd say, well, it's not my product, okay? So I, I will actually go and take the time and effort to go to see that person and let them know what they can do to make it a better experience. And I've been told that nobody ever does that. So I'm very, very grateful for that and I take the time to do it. Um, another thing is, is that, um, I recently got an acquisition of a distributor, and I'm very excited about that because that will help me, uh, again, be able to 
pull back and not have to think that I've got to do all the sales, all the marketing, everything. Uh, I'm not that computer savvy. I don't have time to sit in front of a computer very often, okay? <laughs> I mean, people say, Chef, I, uh, I emailed you three days ago. Uh, have you gotten that? I don't know. I've got 400 emails in my, in my box. Let me check, you know? So we kind of laugh about it. And um, uh, one of the things that my customers love is that I have a very sarcastic sense of humor. But it's only something I offer on, letter, on days of the week that begin with the letter T, okay? <laughs> I kind of cut it down. So that's Tuesday, Thursday, today, and tomorrow. So that is when I offer my sarcasm. And yeah, so as you get it, uh, one of the things that's very, very important to me is making sure that what I do is consistent. And um, I need people that can help keep me straight. I've got several friends that you know will call me and they'll check up on me and make sure that I'm doing everything okay. And uh, and that's that's truly a blessing. Another thing is I'm very involved with uh, with veterans groups in Dallas because. Uh, my brother was an army veteran. My uncles were in World, uh, were in, uh, world War II. Uh, actually, my brother's named after my uncle that was killed at Battle of the Bulge. And um, a percentage of my sales goes back to a 501c3 veterans group because I believe in giving back. I believe in helping people. And I also believe in helping our next generation of kids. So if I have kids that are troubled or at risk, I help them. I take them under my arm and I kind of encourage them. Does anybody have any questions? Are we good? All right. Well, we've got a good last for 10 minutes. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions. Sorry, you oh, guys. You've got a cool setup. Surprise, I'm here. So um, I have this microphone over here. Please raise your hand and I will bring the microphone to you. Uh, congratulations, it sounds like you're successful. I'm actually not sure. So uh, what exactly, how exactly can we help you? It was unclear what, what you're looking for here today. Okay, yeah, I, I, uh, I understand that. I wasn't sure how to propose this. But I'm actually looking for people with uh, business skills. Okay. Do you that, mentor or coach? Well, probably to maybe even partner with that understand food service systems and how they work. Okay, uh, to me that's very, very important so that I can be out, again, talking to people and helping to, um, uh, to grow the business and, as opposed to... You're going to hire a CEO? I'm really trying to figure out what... Yeah, I've been doing everything. So, I mean, sales, marketing, uh, you know, uh, just, just everything, really. I have been doing everything. So, to me... If I had people that had that wisdom that wanted to share that with me, okay, I wanted to partner, somebody that uh, wanted a business but also is strong in certain areas but not strong in others, perhaps we can, and I'm talking to several people right now just about that, so that's exciting too. So my question is on the statement that you made about working uh, on your business versus in your business, which I think is the, the point that you're trying to make. What is it that you're doing? What system are you following? Is there a recommendation that you're looking for um, to work on your business versus in it? Because working in it is trying to hire the people and going through that, and that's one component of that strategy. Is there a, a methodology that you're following? Is there a book that you're reading? Is there something that you're doing otherwise? Well, I read a lot of, I read a lot of books, but uh, most of all, um, what I've been doing is basically running by the seat of my pants because people will call me and they'll say, oh, chef, I need a cake by next week. Okay, so, because I also do my pastries. Okay, I do my baking and my pastries if people need it. Can I add a, a book to your list then? What's that? Can I add a book to your list? Which one? The E-Myth Revisited. Yeah. Okay, so that example should be one that, that resonates with you. Got it, yes. Okay, awesome. Yes, I've got that. So you're you're selling coleslaw. What's the shelf life? Um, are you working with grocery stores as well? So it's kind of a, is it a branded coleslaw that you have a, on a shelf? And, good, good question. Um, who's good. your target market on that? Yeah, area? good question. Um, the shelf life now mostly what I've been selling is my uh, 
food service pouches. I decided to package them not in containers, but in pouches because they're eco-friendly, there's no waste as opposed to using the bottles or the jugs. There's absolutely no waste. The chefs love it at the hotels because they're getting full, you know, uh, full, uh, full use of their, of their buck. So um, that's been really helpful. It's an all natural sauce. The shelf life unopened is 13 months, 13 to 15 months, and that's awesome. And once it's open and mixed with the produce, there's six day shelf life. And that's three times longer than what most chefs are getting. They have to throw it out in two days. So to piggyback on that, i um, thinking you have kind of the, the veteran story tied in there. Have you reached out to the commissaries, uh, Naval, Navy exchanges, Army exchanges, and things like that to maybe in, kind of get into the grocery store line since you kind of have that veteran touch? Uh, yes, I've actually talked to APHIS, but APHIS told me that I needed to be in grocery stores like Kroger, Tom Thumb, and places like that. Um, Albertsons before they will bring my product in, okay? However, uh, what I'm trying to do is work with um, businesses that already do business with, like the DOD and um, uh, the APHIS, and see if they can piggyback my product on there as a sub, okay? Uh, I go to the Small Business Development Center too, and they, they help me um, in government stuff. Again, I don't have time to sit behind a desk and do government contracts. So that's another thing that I would need help with because I think there's tremendous potential out there uh, for me. So um, the thing about getting my product on the basis is that I'm talking to food service distributors. I just got a distributor um, to carry my product, but they don't do the basis. So a uh, company like Cisco, I'm doing my paperwork with Cisco because they want to bring my product in and help me get on the basis. And that's, that's pretty much where that's going. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, sorry, just one yes. shout out to the deck. You know, they do a thing called um, whiteboard sessions where uh, their mentors will make themselves available and you can come in and talk about, you know, if you've got a certain thing that you're oh, trying that right? to work through. So I definitely check out the deck website for the whiteboard sessions. So I have okay. great people there. Thank you. Those are free and open to the public. Wonderful. Up in the back. Hey, um, regarding um, the the two businesses, is I'm just, are they both profitable? Is the pastry business funding the other one, or is the kind of the revenues from each one? I'm just curious, kind of where they are revenue-wise, profit-wise. So you know, you're running your pastry. Sort of what's What's the volume in your overall revenue for that versus, you know, the one you're working on now? I'm just trying to get a sense of those two. Okay, my I'm I'm really not pushing my baking and pastries right now. People that know me, that say, oh, chef, I'm doing a party for 300 people. Can I get, you know, can I get truffles? Okay, so I'll do it for them. All right, but I've been focusing on the sauce because the sauce is something I don't have to make myself. It's being made, it's consistent, it's under all the FDA guidelines, everything. I just basically need help with sales to get it out to more places. Because I can only be in so many places at one time. I mean, when I leave here, I go around to see hotels. Some are my customers, some are my future customers. So I don't, uh, I don't sleep much. I don't. If I get five hours, I'm really lucky. So, yes? Hi, Chef. Thank you for Hi. being here. Um, so when you're asking that you need help with the things that you've been mentioning, are you asking you need mentors? Are you asking for volunteers? Are you hiring? Are you looking for internship people to help you with the, the things that you're mentioning? Okay. Um, here's the thing, too. Okay. Uh, and I'll take a couple minutes here. Uh, I have an opportunity in front of me to open a retail cafe and bakery, all right? Um, I'll share a little bit with you. I want to hire people that have that savvy, that business background. I want to hire at-risk kids, and I want to hire the military so that we can someday throw away this ring, okay, which is the 22 kill. I want to give people a purpose. Because I know my purpose, I was brought in life, it is a passion to me to help other people. Whether it's through food, whether it's through opportunity. Uh, in the beginning, if they want to stodge, 
next to me, okay, and, and learn my business so that they can help me and, become, and come on board and be paid to do that, that's fine. If they want to be paid right away, I don't know their skills yet, so I'm cautious about that because I've been there, done that, and got burnt, lost a lot of money. So I'm very, 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 very cautious. Um, if they want to learn the business, learn hospitality, learn food service, I take calls all day, things like that. People will call me, they just got out of culinary school, and they'll say, hey chef, how does this work, okay? Because you don't get out of culinary school expecting to be an executive chef, that's not the way it is. You gotta put in your blood, sweat, and tears for many years. I graduated in 92. So. All right, so just to kind of build up on that, we're gonna close off the questions, and our final question is, what can the community do for you? Uh, any ideas that you might have to help me grow my business would be very, very helpful. And if you have a particular talent that you're looking to grow and I can help you, I'm there for you. to kick off the program. Uh, before we have our next presenter take the stage, just a quick reminder that we are very active on social media. We have all of our Twitter handles and the presenter's Twitter handles up here with our hashtag 1MCDAO. So please, we encourage you to go join the conversation, uh, provide feedback, any other questions if you haven't asked them here, send them there, we'll respond. Uh, we love seeing all the community come together like that. And then we also have a big board out by the elevator. So if you do have any community events, please share them with us there. All right, well, without further ado, we'd like to stand up one more time, bring in our next presenter, Sunit of uh, Heal Pal Inc. So good morning. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Dr. Sunit Sebastian, and I'm the co-founder of Heal Pal. Uh, I'm very excited to share with you the positive impact that we are making in the lives of cancer patients uh, today. Let's take a quick uh, 30 seconds because I know I only six minutes. Just uh, look at the person next to you, say a quick hello, and answer the question saying, Hi, do you know anybody, family, friend, relative, neighbor who has cancer? A quick yes or no among yourselves. Just yes or no. And raise your hand if the answers are yes, it's a shotgun poll. It's not statistically viable, but let's do it. So all of you almost, and Chef, I know you two did have one. So uh, it would be very safe to say that we all probably have had that experience, and this is a real problem. And the numbers are pretty sobering. Uh, lots of money spent on this uh, statistical model presented by the WHO and says one in two men and one in three women are going to face the diagnosis of cancer at some point in their life, and that is pretty sobering. Uh, if you've seen these patients, think about how you felt when you interacted with them and the problems that they faced while uh, they were on cancer treatment. And I'll tell you that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I know you're very excited to, look, you know, to hear about uh, you know, what we do and how we do, but I think uh, uh, this part also deserves a mention, which is why we started doing this. And actually, this came out of an interaction with a patient, and uh, she said, you know, she was frustrated, stressed out. She said, you know, I don't believe in doctors at all. Agreeable. You guys talk too much, give me a lot of information, and want me to take critical decisions in a couple of days, and sign forms in which there is always, always death written somewhere. Uh, I want to be connected to somebody who is exactly like me, and I want to get access to knowledge that says, okay, this is a physician with proven treatments and has access to proven clinical trials. So at that point in time, I was pretty busy and so I didn't take note of it. So it became a recurring theme. And I think what she did was sow a seed in my head, which later on became heel path that we're now trying to nourish as a tree. So these are the fundamental problems that any cancer patient who goes through our complex health system faces. And if you look at it, uh, it's not all doom and gloom. By 2022, about 18 million survivors will have lived with cancer. The cost of treatment is upwards of 150 billion in 2018. So all these people need help. How do we do it? The first problem of 
overwhelming information has been solved on our side by the production of content that is very easy to understand, minus the medical jargon, wherever possible, in the form of infographics. Very little prose, a lot of pictures, small lines for them to, to digest tidbits of information. We are going to convert this into one minute videos very soon. But this is where the magic sauce really happens. She said, Patience, who's exactly like me, and we actually Googled for it, and there is a company that is called Patience Like Me. But it still didn't bring the match of one patient to the other. So we had to borrow the idea from the dating world. And what we did was we matched one patient to the other based on about 50 characteristics that are very specific for each cancer. So where's the magic? The magic is when we are so specific, you know, we are truly able to match one person to the other in different strengths. So you may match with somebody who is 80% similar to you in characteristics or 40% similar to you in characteristics. They may be in your same town, same zip code, or somewhere else, even in some other country. But when the match is so specific, what happens is the interaction becomes very, very crucial, high quality, and high value. It's not a pity party, it is an exchange, or rather I should say once connected, it's an exchange of two deliverables. You have to tell each other who is your physician and does do his treatments work, and the other is do the clinical trials work that she was on. Very, very vital information for a cancer patient who is really clutching on distress. But the brains of the operation we call as Everest, and what Everest is, a data analytics engine. So all we want is not big data. I get really frustrated when I hear that word. Let's say simple data, simple information. As simple as in my zip code, if I'm a 42-year-old male, and if I have breast cancer, and breast cancer does occur in males, uh, I want to know in that support how many Indians with my age, with my education, really have breast, breast cancer. And I want to reach out to them and really learn from their experiences, and then get charged up and take control of my treatment. We have gone to market with breast cancer, and uh, we launched in March 2016. Uh, we uh, are partnering with cancer foundations, support groups, attending social media and events organized by cancer patients, and also we are forming partnerships with physician associations and cancer navigators. So it's free for patients right now, and uh, we intend to charge $7.99 a year. We have some decent competition in the space, but we uh, differentiate on the basis of our cancer niche. We have a very good team of healthcare and technology who are working day and night to uh, achieve our goal. We have launched, we have about uh, 1,600 breast cancer patients on the platform. We have raised seed money from Silicon Valley and uh, Health Wildcatters, of which we are a program, and we are raising $750,000. Thank you. And this is my contact. Happy to talk after this. Awesome, we're gonna open it up for questions. Please raise your hand high, extend that elbow so I can bring you the microphone. Over here. Just one quick question for you. Sure. How do you monetize that? So what we're going to do is, uh, in a few months, we're going to charge a subscription fee to the cancer patients, about $7, $7.99 a month. But more importantly, uh, the associations and partnerships with pharmaceutical companies for the uh, enrollment to clinical trials, because they're always looking out for patients, and we would have a very organized database of which patient has cancer with multiple characteristics. I have run clinical trials myself. Uh, in my previous career, and uh, also collaborating with physicians who want to give second opinions to patients, uh, which is very, very important uh, for them. So that's, again, a subscription fee. And more importantly, be a marketplace uh, for cancer patients where they can get anything from a wig. Most patients don't even know where they can get a wig or a fitted bra or a ride uh, with Uber uh, to go to their chemotherapy appointment. So uh, there are multiple ways of uh, monetizing it. And we have got a survey done that says patients are willing uh, to pay uh, if it is the right price. Um, how are these people communicating? Is it all on the platform? Or is it like just getting them in touch and then they take it away? No, it is all on the platform. It is a closed loop to, uh, to uh, take care of security. Um, uh, we want to keep it on the platform forever if possible because for obvious reasons. Uh, and we monitor it very, very closely for spam or uh, you know advertisements that are not uh, condoned by us. So yes, it is. Uh, think about it. If you want to take it away, 
I think about it like a LinkedIn uh, for cancer patients, but powered by a match.com uh, engine. And then what we get is like a business analytics model out of it, uh, sorry, cancer analytics model out of it. <laughs> so what's the personal connection that made you leave practicing medicine and start this company? Oh, you're going to make me cry now. Don't do that. But anyways, uh, I lost uh, my two arms uh, to breast cancer on both my dad's and my mom's side. And one of them actually was a nurse for uh, about 26 years. And uh, she actually paid for my medical education. I was very, very poor when I was in India. And uh, she really paid for it. And you know, as a doctor, I work very closely with cancer patients, but you cannot be empathetic enough because when you see the patients there, you're seeing only one point in their life that is the present, and then you see the future, which mostly is downhill. But when it came to my aunt, I'd seen her whole life, right? And so you see the whole trajectory in front of you, a very, you know, intelligent, uh, funny, uh, you know, uh, wonderful human being, and suddenly just produced to a caricature of yourself. So you have that whole gamut of images in front of you. And then I was able to spend you know, the last few days of her life with her. I'm sorry, my voice is quitting. But uh, it is, uh, that was the one point that was always on my mind. But I think the patient, that African-American patient who was a high school principal, really taught me a lesson. She just whacked me on my cheek and made me question everything that I was doing. And so both me and my co-founders, uh, left our jobs and uh, said we're going to do this full time and give it all it takes. Okay. Thanks for the question. Thank you for sharing that. That was, that was good. Um, kind of a two-part question. I'm hearing, I guess, a few problems you're, you're solving, whereas one is, seems like it's support and the other is information and then sort of resources. Is there, I'm not getting a sense of maybe what's the biggest problem they're kind of like, which gap are you trying to fill the most? As you mentioned, into the resources. And, and one example would be, you know, the healthcare advocacy. So I can email specialist call that's starting to come into, you know, insurance and, and non-insurance benefits. So I can call a specialist to get expertise that way. So within that realm, kind of, you can help clarify the problem and, and the gap. Sure. And I think it's not clear because we, we pitch and we use PowerPoint. It's like an itemized bill, you know, but, uh, if you look at the problem, it is not like one, two, three, or three, two, one. It's a dynamic problem. They may face all three on a particular day, they may face one on a particular day. So all those solutions have to be interlinked with each other. All right? I cannot uh, emphasize on just one, because that would be like patients like me. They emphasize only on collecting information. All right? it's, a, it's a more pure business model, but uh, it's, it's one-sided, I feel. That's my critique, uh, not as a competitor, but as a physician and probably who's had patients and family members who have died of cancer. So it's not a business, pretty. What, if I want to take something from them, I feel that I should give 10x back to them. And when I talk to these patients and we have our focus groups, uh, you know, I ask them and we have all three questions. Oh, I love the content, but I did not use the match. Or I use the match and it is wonderful. And actually I tell you, last week I got an email from a patient in Alabama who was not put on a clinical trial. She connected with a patient and was put, put on a clinical trial on her advice, and she found out that her insurance pays for it. She wrote me an email saying, I'm thankful uh, you saved my life. I said, no, that other patient saved your life. But she said, you made the medium to connect with her. So, you know, yes, on the point, I've write it one, two, three, but I feel in my heart and in my brain that I'm solving all three together, which are fundamentally the three most important ones. Go ahead. Um, so I think what you're doing is awesome. Uh, sorry, here. I think what you're doing is awesome, and uh, I'm excited that the type of program exists. What I'm curious is, and I am speaking from a point of ignorance in that I have a, an aunt who survived breast cancer, but I know that there are a lot of people, obviously, that die from cancer-related uh, illnesses. So is it, is it closed-loop support, as in, I create a relationship with another cancer patient and that cancer patient passes away and I know that the relationship that a cancer patient would, would start in that whole process is oftentimes on the rocks in general because they don't always have the, the most confidence in their treatment plan. But if someone passes away, is there support for them at that point and then how, does, how do you get over that? If someone passes away, is there support for somebody else who's connected with them? 
Am I rephrasing it right? Yeah, beautiful question. See, the whole idea is a newly diagnosed patient whose life gets turned upside down when they have a cancer diagnosis. It's absolutely chaotic. So we want to connect people who are a little further along in the disease so they can be actually mentors or coaches to these patients. And cancer patients are uniquely qualified for that because they've gone through so much, have researched so much. I'll tell you, they know more than their primary care physicians and they are family physicians in a month or two. And sometimes, even like specialists like me, they come in with something that I don't know or I haven't heard. Uh, so we, when we match them, we give them a slew of 10 matches, which ranks from 100%, there's never a 100% match, not even in a twin, to about, uh, let's say, 50%. And so there is always a choice, she knows, and we keep updating these matches, as in when she completes her profile completely, those matches are, they will change. It's again a dynamic process. So if she connected with somebody who's 95%, then the next 85% exists. And the truth of the matter is, once you're diagnosed with cancer, the clock really starts ticking irrespective of what somebody says. There is a lucky handful who survive and do well because their genetic composition really responds to the treatment. Uh, but I'm of the opinion that it really starts taking. I've seen it in front of me. So there is support for them. There's a next match that is available. Uh, we also are now planning to get cancer navigators into the program who will jump in if that happens. They can be contacted and then they will lead them onwards. So we're really getting a fantastic cancer navigator on board as one of our advisors. She's been doing this for 39 years uh, here in Dallas. Uh, and that too, it's thanks to the program that I'm in. But yes, it's a fantastic question. question yes, ma'am. Hi there, thanks. Hi. So um, how many matches to date have successfully, successfully happened? And how do you rate successful matches? What is do they remain in communication for a certain amount of time, or I don't know? So uh, we have about uh, 1,600 patients, and we have made, I think, about 950. I don't know the exact number today, maybe 10, 15 up and down, but uh, the way we measure it is how, how much time do they take to connect, how responsive they are to each other, the number of messages exchanged in a day. Uh, they also help us for our own business analytics, uh, you know, uh, of retention, engagement, and that's why I'm not a doctor, I can't go much into that. But uh, uh, if there is a problem, with it, and that's the one that we're more worried of. We don't want anybody to have, you know, hurt anybody on the platform, you know, provide wrong information, and be very, very uh, cautious about that, uh, and very, very, um, what should I say, very stringent about it. Uh, so we, we monitor those things very carefully. And any, any red flag uh, is immediately, we had a few, uh, is immediately, you know, uh, we put out the fire immediately. So yes, uh, and remember, it's still very uh, young. It's an infant. Uh, the more <laughs> it is, uh, the more uh, bigger it gets. Uh, it'll become more mature. Uh, the f you know, it, it's run by just like Facebook or any other social platform. I hate to use the word social platform because this is not social networking. Um, I would call it an outcome-based networking where everybody's looking for a great outcome. I hope I answered the question. All right, we're down to our final question. We're running low on time, so if you could just wrap it up quickly. What can the community do for you? All right. So I'm a part of the Health by Cadiz program, and I'm blessed to have phenomenal support, uh, guidance. Uh, but my request to you is, uh, I don't think, uh, if you have not noticed the website address, it's www.healpal.me. We didn't get the .com address, which actually is better, because it's Healpal and me. So to spread the word, uh, it's a mission more than a business. Uh, you know, that's how it grows. Um, and if uh, you feel you have any critiques, suggestions, please send them my way. My contact was there on the last slide, Sebastian, and ask a heat pal. Uh, I know there's not time for everybody to ask a question, but any feedback for the people who are shy to ask, please do so. I would love to hear your comments and critique. Thank All right, you. one more round of applause for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I'm uh, just gonna be up here real quick. Uh, we just have one more presenter. Uh, please, everyone, stand up one more time. Big round of applause. Let's bring up Trevin from Quick Play. Thanks so much. Hello, my name is Trevin Cole. I'm a co-founder of Quick Play, and my uh, other co-founder, Oyaka, is right there. Um, I'll just jump right in. 
Um, there may be a lot of questions. I think that that maybe some questions are answered. Um, so yeah, just feel free to fire away. And there's us. Um, okay. So digital news media is currently decentralized on the web and is found primarily through uh, direct search that's searching for a news story or an article just directly on, the, on a platform like Google or a search engine like Google. Um, or it's found through your personal ne social network. So that's your Facebooks, your Twitter. So if someone shares something within your network, that's how you generally will find it. This is slow and rarely allows you to find things beyond your particular search or network. So whenever you go and you search for a story, whether it's something like the Turkish coup, you're not going to find anything beyond the Turkish coup. That's it. Or if someone's uh, in, you know, similar, whenever someone shares a story uh, about, you know, the Turkish coup in your network, you're not going to go beyond um, that, that particular story. So what we do is we offer a centralized publishing platform that brings information media to you, and we do this in the form of video. So rather than doing something that's text-based, uh, similar to what Medium does, video and digital media in particular really seem to be sort of the new frontier of, of media. So whenever it comes to journalism having merit uh, socially, it makes sense in text because it's easy and accessible, but it makes sense in video because you can actually video things in real time, and you can video things where it's a, a subjective point of view of the actual event itself. So journalists and everyday people go through a long, arduous process in order to have their journalistic content published and distributed through major media organizations. If I'm a journalist, or even if I'm an independent citizen, and I cover a story, or I come across a story, and I reach out to someone, you know, whether it be the New York Times, or CNN, or uh, the Dallas Morning News, I'm going to have to go through a long, archaic process. And everything falls on me, which I'll deal with uh, in a second, uh, the next slide. So you deal with this long, archaic process of a back and forth between CNN and usually, or, or CNN, New York Times, any, any news organization. So the back and forth is so extensive, and you're doing this all on your own, which is its own can of worms. So what we offer is a flat platform, allowing everyone to share directly with an audience and quickly and easily publish their content. So rather than going through a long, painful distribution process or a long process in which you're negotiating the pay that you receive from a major news organization or um, you, know, you would be essentially fighting for your value, we offer a flat platform where everyone can immediately and easily upload uh, whatever stories that they may have. Okay, so there are a lot of moving pieces to the journalistic process. This is touching back on what I said earlier about everyone handling everything individually and on their own. You're essentially a one-man band as a journalist. So you budget, you shoot, you have to research, you have to do all of your legal support, you have to edit yourself, and they're all each involved processes. So independent journalists normally have to do all of this uh, on their own, which is obviously not ideal. So what we focus on is we allow people to connect in, essentially in, uh, really create networks and join networks of people that would fulfill, uh, I guess, complementary talents, like the complementary uh, need for, um, well, I guess, whatever. Really, whatever they would need, as far as you know, when it comes to budgeting, shooting, editing, um, research. So you can actually form groups that they are complement. Where all the people in the group are complementary to one another. So, if I'm a journalist and I shoot a story or I research a story heavily, and I can just send that to my editor rather than editing it myself and focusing on you know back again to the long, painful distribution process. Um, so we allow journalists to build their own networks rather than peddling their content to the big guys and doing everything yourself in the end anyway. Um, impactful journalistic content can often be overlooked for the favor of clickbait. Basically, when it comes to being a platform, any platform, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, uh, Medium, it really tends to be things that catch your eye rather than things of uh, sort of objective value. So whether that's production content, um, 
or really well done research, generally um, the quality is it tends to be low on those on those um, platforms just because they value uh, essentially the monetization over the actual content itself. So. When we curate compelling content over clickbait and incentivize value, similar to how Medium would curate their categories. So whenever Medium curates their categories or whatever tab that they would have for the week, they do it on purpose to bring in the most uh, objectively uh, qualified content. So we also do the same thing. Open publishing platform is monetized through advertising. That's generally the idea. That's generally how things are done. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some questions about that. Additionally, monetized through a Patreon like or a Twitch bits like system. So Twitch has a thing called bits. It's a direct compensation system between uh, the uploader and the user. Uh, we are, offer the same thing. Um, and then and there's obviously a, a need for. Please raise your hand high, and I will bring you the microphone. So, how how do you validate the source, though? Like the journalist posting on your platform, how how, how can I trust whatever they okay. post out there? So, if it's first person, generally that's pretty subjective. Um, if it's first person and someone's on the street and they're filming an event as it happens, it's generally pretty trustworthy. Um, I guess you could ask the same question about major news organizations, the same thing. So I think that's always going to be a concern when it comes to journalism. Um, for the most part, whenever you have to validate that information, it is something that you do yourself, even when it comes from a major news organization. So I think that from the user perspective, that's something that they would almost have to make a judgment call on. I don't think that's something that people would generally just be like, uh, or, or we as founders or whether we have an editorial staff would be able to be like, hey, this is 100% is, uh, true and accurate just because there's subjectivity always involved. And I think that that's something that's just a judgment call on behalf of the user. It makes sense to not have control of it and let it be up to the user. So I may have a very different opinion on this election compared to someone else or I may see an event from a different uh, perspective than someone else. So I think it's just up to really the user to determine the value in, in one or the other. Question over here. How do you ensure the quality of the information that's posted on your site? And I say that kind of thinking about when you mentioned your editor networks. How do you ensure the quality of those people as the content's coming in, that it's going to stay the way that it was intended to stay, and then mm -hmm. move on to your platform in the way that the open journalism is there? So whenever uh, you come to us, we curate, uh, I guess, what would be subjectively the most meaningful content, because obviously, whenever you have humans involved, there's always going to be some level of subjectivity. So whenever it comes to actually um, sort of verifying the quality, that's something that also users would do themselves to an extent, but with an editorial team or even with us founders ourselves, whenever we look at the call at the content we actually particularly look at the production value the uh, the value of the research and how in-depth it is similar to what medium does so medium has an editorial staff that goes in and they evaluate um, really the value in an article an individual article and that's really how they find the value in that so I think for us early on as an, as co-founders that's our job but eventually that would obviously to an extent be sourced with an editorial staff that would sort of judge quality uh, Somewhat as objectively as possible, I guess, as objective as it could be with you. Hey, thanks for uh, presenting today. It's always tough to sometimes can be tough to get up in front of this audience. <laughs> um, and I do want to give you some feedback on the pitch itself. Um, I'm not a journalist, I don't publish uh, anything like that, so I actually didn't understand some of the things you were talking about. I don't know what Twitch or Twitch bits are. So, okay. you for an audience like this, you might want to generalize and walk us through what you're doing and how it's different rather than dive into stuff that we might not understand. Thanks. Um, I'll just refer to the Twitch. So Twitch, generally when we talk about what we do in video, people immediately relate us to YouTube because that's sort of the incumbent when it comes to uh, being an open platform. And I think Twitch, uh, for video. So I think when it comes to Twitch, as a competitor to YouTube, that's a really good use case to look at and say, okay, these guys, 
really pin down a single market rather than so Twitch is a gaming pl oh sorry yeah Twitch is a, a gaming platform so it's exactly like YouTube except it's only for gaming um, so I guess if you're not in the gaming community it wouldn't make sense but they actually have a uh, system in which they have direct compensation for uh, the uploader so if, if someone likes an uploader they can send them bids it's a sort of an online currency, I guess, from them. So I guess that's the best way to explain it, but yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take note. Over here. So I'm just curious, so this is a completely video-based platform, correct? Completely video-based. So who is your target audience? Because as someone who consumes news via radio, I use Flipboard and then just search news sites on my own and go to sources that I know and trust. Uh, I'm just curious how you would try and convert it seems like a pretty tall order, in a, in a good way. Like, you seem up for the challenge, but I'm just curious who you're specifically trying to target with this. So, I believe it's something around the tune of 60% of Americans uh, daily consume news. So, they usually consume things through, you know, their social networks or things like Flipboard. Um, the, the issue with going in and saying, I can search for things directly, is that you have to really trust the source. So that can also that can kind of be an echo chamber sometimes if that's the only source I want to hear from. But whenever you come in and you're like, okay, the New York Times is the source I'm going to go with, that's generally not what people do. They usually search the topic. So with us, I don't think it's that we're discriminating against the big guys because I think the big guys are completely equitable on the platform. I think it makes sense to essentially bring in, uh, you know, the New York Times or CNN or whoever the big guys and the big incumbents are um, in news media because. It's really just another channel for them to share their stuff. So if that's somebody you follow, you can also follow them on our platform. I think with what you said with audio is really key because I think another statistic would be 17% of people exclusively, 100% exclusively listen to news. So if you turn off your screen, it's just really a podcast. So in the same sense of you receiving your news, your news in multiple manners, you can actually do that with us. So I think it makes sense for us because there's no single location for information media unless you go to something like Flip, uh, Flipboard, which is, uh, you know, really multiple forms. So whenever you come to us, I think video is really just kind of the new frontier. It's kind of going to be the most used frontier just because it's easy. It takes no work on my part. I don't have to read. And even when it comes to, to podcasting, I don't actually have to actively listen. I can just sit and look at my phone for... Uh, whatever period of time the video is, and it's really simple, and that's something that people are comfortable with. So I think that that's where it makes sense for us uh, competing in the industry. Over here. Yeah, nice presentation. Uh, do you have any uh, rules of engagement for users and some uh, reward mechanism? Because I heard the way in word gaming. That's all I know about it. But uh, a little more than that, the Twitch thing. The Twitch thingy is. Is that like a money, or is there a business model, or is that and the click? And there was a word I didn't, I was not able to read. So Twitch Bits is just a direct compensation system. So whenever you buy in, Twitch is just another entirely different platform. But whenever you go into Twitch, you can actually spend I don't know, you spend you spend five to ten dollars uh, to buy with these, these things called Bits, and it's just sort of a uh, online currency on the platform itself. So it actually compensates uh, an uploader directly from a user. So if I enjoy what you make, then I can compensate you directly. So that's all that is. Um, there was a second half to your question, uh, the first half of your question. What was the first half of your question? Because do you have any rewards for engagement? So I think the biggest reward for uh, engagement would be really just followers, influence. So if you create quality stuff, if you have a lot of very high quality engagement, you're more likely to actually be curated to the front page, so you're seen by a larger audience. So it's really beneficial um, to the uploaders themselves whenever they're able to engage and create quality things because then they're on the front page of the, of the platform itself. So then the, whatever topic they are covering, they're seen by a large number of people, and that just really expands their audience, increases their advertising revenue, and increases the likelihood of them actually being compensated directly by an audience on behalf of the audience just being bigger. Have you had a chance to talk to any journalists yet about the idea to see what their feedback is? We um, actually, I actually communicated with um, a newspaper editor in my hometown. My grandpa is a local politician, so he's really in tune with the media locally. So actually talking to them, it was good to get their perspective on things. Um, 
it seems to be that when it comes to traditional news organizations, we would be more of an avenue uh, to be noticed, much more than um, sort of the, the sole uh, provider of their information. So I think that's really where their perspective um, is most heard, is whenever it's like, okay, rather than being um, the single channel we're going to distribute our news, this will be just an alternate channel for us to distribute beyond our, our current print publication or television uh, series or, or whatever you know, that we would be doing. All right, we're going to close it out with our final question. What can the community do for you? So we just want feedback. We appreciate tough questions. We actually sort of got to where we are just based on people asking us really tough questions. Um, so I think that feedback is the most valuable for us. We're pre-launch, um, so we're actually in development now. We're on uh, in development on iOS and the web. Um, it's a little tough working on that stuff with two people. So any sort of advisement, any sort of uh, connections are really valuable to us, especially being in the early stage that we're in, but feedback is really, really valuable. Um, so it really allows us to sort of uh, be flexible to the market before we actually go to market. So I think that that's really just where we're at and what you guys can do for us is just, if you want to sign up for the beta or you have any feedback, um, I think there's a slide here that actually has our info. So you can just reach me at trevin at clickflick.com and uh, that would be the easiest way to, to send us feedback or, uh, or send us any, any suggestions. So that's, that's really why we're here is just to get sort of a gauge of, uh, of interest and a little bit of, of feedback from you guys. All right, one more round of applause for ClickFlick. say a special thank you to our amazing vendors today. Uh, big thank you to House of Genius for keeping us caffeinated. And yes, big round of applause, because that's so important for us entrepreneurs. And then a major thank you to Pin and Strike for providing our mimosas today. So if you have, yes, yes, getting the party started early. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance yet to go visit him, please do. He's a luxury uh, menswear specializing in custom fabrics, suits, accessories. Uh, he does have a really great special for everyone to redeem today. So please go visit him and uh, catch that special offer. But uh, once again, thank you guys for joining. Uh, please stay network, grab some, grab some drinks, and then uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.